Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 29. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today, we've got a full house. We have Orion. Hello. We have Matt. Hello. We have the other Matt, who we call Bubba, all the way over in Connecticut. Hello. And for the first time ever, Lindsay. Hello. Who's all the way somewhere else in Massachusetts, and I don't remember where. They are discussing with us remotely, and we just finished this past weekend with PAX East. We have a PAX cast spectacular. Did you fill out your bracket, Geesman? I, I did. I saw your bracket. I noticed that conveniently you had the Penguins winning. I just choose the winning teams. I have nothing to contribute to this conversation. Yeah. Neither does anyone else, because no but... one else likes hockey. <laughs> Except for I don't Eastman. dislike hockey. Oh, in in golf news, apparently I didn't watch it, but Jordan Spieth or Spieth, I don't remember how to Spieth. pronounce Spieth. You, wait, you're a golf fan and you don't know how to pronounce Jordan Spieth? Is it Spieth? Spieth. I'm a fan of Spieth. golf. I haven't really kept up with professional golf since high school. Wow. I don't okay. know. I just haven't kept up with it. Anyway, apparently he almost mounted the greatest comeback in Masters history. But some other other guy whose name I don't remember or I had heard of ended up winning instead. I don't know how you can call it the greatest comeback when you start round one with a six under and lead the pack by like I, three strokes. Well, the article <laughs> I read, no, no, the article I read said that he was going into round four. He was down eight shots, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That but would have like, been the greatest comeback ever. Sure. Anyway, yeah, I don't keep up with golf that much the problem is that golf on television is so inferior to golf live that now that i've been to a few pro golf tournaments it's it's lame in comparison and it's inferior to actually playing golf like the other sports like we went to the hockey game earlier this winter and that was super fun but it's not that much better than watching hockey on tv i would only go see hockey live i would never watch it on tv I mean, of the team I would, sports... I like, would agree. Hockey. Like, hockey, I think, is the best to watch live. I enjoy watching hockey live. Of the team sports, it's improved the most. I'd rather really? watch football from home. I think baseball is far better on TV. I love the experience of going to the park, but the actual game is so much harder to right. follow. That's what we're all arguing. Like, we're saying hockey is the best live. That's what I'm oh, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't oh. been to basketball. I've been to, like, oh, okay. college I've, basketball. I've heard basketball is good life, too, but hockey is definitely a lot better life. I think you yeah. originally said the opposite. Sorry, I'm thinking about board games. It's like this is a board game podcast are or something. Are board games better right. live or on the internet? Board games are definitely better live. And we played a lot of them at PAX East. I'm curious, though, it was Bubba and Lindsay's first PAX East. It was Lindsay's first PAX entirely. Bubba was at PAX Unplugged with us. What did you guys think of the massive experience of that convention? Lindsay, you can go first because I'm going to poop all over it after you go. <laughs> wow. I guess I'm the, optimist. I'm the optimistic of the two of us. So, I mean, this is my second board game convention just in general ever. The first one that I went to was the one that we Went to New Hampshire, and I actually, I enjoyed that a lot because I felt like it was just small enough where you could build a community and you felt comfortable enough to just walk up to a table and start playing games. I mean, in general, I guess I feel comfortable just walking up to random people anyway, but, you know, I got to play a bunch of different stuff. Um, it was small enough format that it was approachable. Um, here, here was super fun. Like, I did definitely enjoy PAX, but it was so crowded that, you know, you were, you were fighting your way in a line of, like, 15 people if you wanted to play a game, and then if you even had table space and stuff like that, but... I really enjoyed it. I like I like lots of people. Um, I like interacting with all sorts of different people. I mean, I don't really care about video games. So to me, that three quarters of the room, you know, virtually could not have existed. And I would have been okay with that. But I don't know. I liked getting to talk to some of the game, the people who have created the games and have people teach me and talk to me about them that were actually responsible for making them. So I enjoyed it. I think My talking turn, to huh? the developers is theoretically the best part of PAX. Yeah. I would agree. And I think that that was a cool, a cool thing for sure. So, all right. So I would agree with that, actually. Talking to the developers is what I was looking for when I was going there. And I just didn't get to do it. Yeah. I went to PAX, PAX Unplugged in November. I think it was November. Yeah. And I got to do that all the time 
at that convention. And it was like one of my favorite things I've ever done. Just going around to different board game creators, developers, uh, publishers, and just picking their brain. And that didn't exist. And like, I, I like video games. I definitely, I'm way more of a board game person. But like, I've gotten into video games a little bit here and there. But like, I felt like even around the edge of the convention where you would expect like these really indie hipster, if you will, type games, I I didn't find myself finding like the actual creators or else if they were there, they were just way too busy and way too preoccupied with other things. Did um, you go to the mega booth? The mega booth? The indie mega booth. I think I just walked by it. Okay, because that's where the real indie stuff at PAX goes on. Okay. Now we we should say so. Pax, I'm sorry. Pax East this year expanded to four days. So Mark Orion and I went on Thursday, and that's when we did most of the the floor. Bubba, you came in on uh, Friday night or Friday? Correct. Friday. Yeah. It was so much more crowded on Friday, and then Saturday was even just more so unbearable. on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, going Thursday for the Expo Hall was the way to go if you wanted to do Expo Hall stuff. I, just specifically talking about getting to meet and, and discuss video games with their developers, we got to do I, I felt like I got to do a lot of that on Thursday in the couple hours that I walked around the video game stuff. Yeah, hmm. the problem is I think they've like maxed out this space. Like it's a huge convention center, but it's sold out every day but Thursday. And at that point, it to me, it's just too crowded it's, in the main expo hall to do anything. It's an, it's just like an incredible spectacle of people. It, it's just more people in one place than anything I've done except for large sporting events. Yeah. So th the other thing that was a little awkward to me was the major title booths. So... Like, I don't get why they were there. So like, For the video games, Bl you mean? Yeah, so like Blizzard, Nintendo, Riot, they all had these huge booths, and I feel like there was nothing at them. For example, Nintendo had this giant space, but it was all walled in, and nobody could see anything inside it unless you waited in this hour-long line, which I wasn't going to do. So I, I don't know what was in there. Blizzard basically just had a storefront, from what I could tell. And Riot was just giving away free t-shirts, and I couldn't find any staff members at all. Like, I just, I guess I wanted to talk to people more, and I, that's what I was going, or that's what I went to the convention expecting. And instead, I just kind of walked through things, and then just gave up, and went and played games. Yeah, I think, Wait. especially in the video game space, there's just too much money in it for that kind of intimacy. Like, you'll see it in board games, and we certainly saw that at PAX Unplugged, but I think once you hit a certain amount of company size and kind of marketing needs, it becomes a marketing endeavor more than a community endeavor. Yeah, and that's interesting. I'm just, I guess, why are they there then? Like, oh, I, I imagine it does well with the marketing. <laughs> you do? Okay. Oh, I, I'm sure. That's fair. There because you have to be like you're at a show because if you're not at a show, then people will wonder why you're not at the show. Like half of a half of a convention is just physically having your name there so that people, you know, see that you're you exist. Well, even I feel if, like even if you're a big a big brand. I feel like for the major brands, the major companies, they're there for the most diehard fans who are going to essentially be at the booth all day long and go to all their events and wait in line half the time just to hit up everything they're doing so the major dota player or lol player or hearthstone player or whatever are going to go there and just do things for those games that's fair uh one last question from last pax east or i don't know how many you guys have been to i think this were was there like more fourth yeah i think fourth, fourth? my second on on the video game sides of things, were there more tournaments in past years? Because like they had for that video big, games. Yeah, they had that big esports arena where they did like NBA two K and soccer, but like I didn't see any 
live Hearthstone or I just felt like uh, there were tournaments at other PAXs. Maybe I'm wrong. Though. I think at last PAX East wrong. there was a whole Hearthstone like arena location. There was, there was a big Hearthstone thing. It was right across from the other arena. Oh, was it oh, there really? this year? Yeah, it was. Like I don't pay attention that much. Gecko Gaming or. Oh, okay. It was yeah. It was like right next to the arena. Pax Gecko. Arena. I don't. I don't remember. It was something. Like that. I think it was Gecko. What was it? Maybe it was. There, there the were Gecko, okay, Gecko. Gecko Gaming. Regarding yeah, I'm just advertising, there were a bunch of tournaments. Um, like you know, once you left the actual main hall, there were like a million tournaments for video games going on. There were also other rooms on the sides that had like console tournaments and stuff. Yeah. 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 The the rooms for for video game stuff, I feel like the rooms around the sides are where it's at because yeah. they're not as crowded and. I know in the past when I've kind of wandered around there, there's been some really cool stuff. All right, but enough about video games, because yeah. we went for the board games. Let's talk about board games. So we did play in a couple of tournaments, and what was your guys' impressions of the the board game tournaments at PAX? I suppose I'll begin. I played in Seven Wonders. It was a fun round of Seven Wonders. I think they got like four six player games going or three six player games going maybe and uh i did very yes. poorly yeah it was three games in the top two moved on i actually played in your game oh yeah we played against each other and both lost yes and then later they wouldn't let me play with Lindsay in another tournament oh that's but unfortunate and i then, tried to get you to play the seven blunders tournament but you wouldn't do that i don't know about seven blunders i suppose my score would have done well in the seven wonders you tournament. would have moved on yes yeah probably no, you would have. And then uh, the Twilight Struggle tournament, there were six of us, and we basically played. So we played three games, and then I won, Bubba won, and some other person won, and I let them play it off. It wasn't particularly structured. I guess that what I'm saying is that the one thing to expect from PAX tournaments, unless it's like a sponsored event, like the Magic stuff, where they, they're actual tournaments and they have judges and such, is that they're really kind of just a way to play a game you want to play with other people. And then you might win a medal. You won a medal, right, Lindsay? Who won a medal? Bubba. The uh, Twilight Struggle. Bubba won a medal. It was oh, yeah, I, yeah. Got, I got some trains. I got some like iridescent purple trains for uh, Ticket to Ride that are like exclusive to tournaments. Oh, nice. So they had promos. That's cool. Yeah, if you were in the final four, you got a um, iridescent purple trains, which were pretty cool. And nice. then Evolution, um, anyone who played, even if you didn't win, got a uh, a free card that is only available at tournaments as well. Oh, really cool. Wish, so it, they it, gave out promo stuff. Yeah, it was like alternate yeah. art for Evolution. That's really nice. That would make the tournaments a lot more appealing, I think, if there was more promo stuff. Also, I want to rant a bit about Fantasy Flight not supporting Netrunner again. Not even in the slightest. At least last year there was a tournament. They had a guy show up and they ran for Swiss or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was fine. It took one guy from Fantasy Flight who was there. Asmodee North America was there. And they had some alt art stuff. And they ran a short little tournament. And it was a great time. And it was very well populated. There were, what, over 20 participants? Yeah, somewhere around there. I think we had 10 or 11 tape or pairings. So Yeah. And this year it was only Destiny. That's all they did. Come on, Fantasy Flight. You're, you're ruining your best game by not supporting it in competitive play very much plus we're in the middle of a really awesome cycle with some great cards and a wonderfully shifting meta at the moment i don't think anyone from fantasy flight is actually listening to this but i needed to get that off my chest i think that um you know for instance with the with the evolution and like ticket to ride they had like you know one o'clock three o'clock five o'clock seven o'clock and it was kind of all the same people in like the you know playing the game just to try to ultimately get the win so you know if you tried it multiple different time slots you would just see all the same people in the same games oh really that's yeah that's what happened with yeah. the that's what happened that the, that i saw or when i was talking to other people that i was playing with all the people in in my group in evolution knew the game way better than me uh, which was really fun like it was definitely a level of, of play above what i'd been a part of before it, it sounds like for like Twilight Struggle, did you feel like that was like really good play? It was quite chill. The two guys I played against were were pretty good. I got really lucky in my first game, and the second game I probably just outplayed him. But yeah, it was 
they were casual. They were definitely casual tournaments. Yeah, which is good though. I think I think that's good for a convention setting. You know, excluding you know the the hardcore Magic players get their thing. The hardcore Destiny players and what else was there? Pokemon was there. Was was running stuff. But uh, I, I like the idea of a tournament structure, something organized for people who know the game but aren't necessarily super competitive at it just so they can get it played. Let's talk about the expo hall now. I don't know what you guys did. Matt and I walked around, like we said before, the expo hall on Thursday because we knew it would be less crowded. We were able to see a lot of cool stuff. It seemed to me like the video games were the, the, the small-time video games were comprised of brutally difficult 2D platformers and esoteric walking simulators, which is a new trend, I think. I, I always imagine that those kinds of games were a little bit more niche, but there were a ton of them there. And surprisingly, mountain biking simulators. I saw three of them, and it was very weird. I played one of them. It was okay. I remember last year we commented on seeing that i don't know seven out of every 10 games seem like some sort of 2d platformer yeah that's still going strong i feel like there are far fewer roguelikes this year that i remember seeing in the past or roguelike style games mm -hmm. i did see two or three what appeared to be big budget generic fantasy mmos which surprised me because i figured that would be a saturated market i don't know where they're getting the funding for that kind of thing the high failure rate of those games. What was the one? Bloodborne? Or what was the No, one? no, no. Bloodborne's a different game. Oh, okay. There was one... I don't remember the names. They were so there boring sounding. Ashes of Creation. Yes, that one. Uh, Original Sin. Divinity? The, Divinity? Oh, that's an... That's not an that's, MMO. Yeah, that's, that's a, a tactical bit. RPG. I actually uh, own that game. The other... The interesting thing on the hall, I think, is that... I don't know. Three of the biggest... Of the five biggest booths were all streaming booths. So, like... Facebook Gaming had a massive booth. Twitch had a big booth. Discord had a big booth. There's a bunch of PUBG set up. Uh, there was a whole hundred person computer set up for games that they were running all the time. There was the arena. There was the Geico Gaming that was, I think it was Hearthstone the whole time. Every time I walked past it, it was Hearthstone. Yeah. There were a couple AAA publishers that weren't there, I think Bethesda. Yeah, Bethesda uh, wasn't there for the first time I've seen. And maybe, I can't, there may be a couple others. Um, I don't think I saw, like, 2K. I, I didn't think see... EA was there. I don't know if they would do this sort of thing, but... Yeah, no, EA's been there in the past. I don't remember seeing EA. Yeah, I don't think... I didn't see there. Ubisoft. That's true, Ubisoft is the other And I think they've been in there in the past. But and, anyways, uh, just interesting to see kind of the change. Last year, there were... I think all of those major studios had a big presence. And this year, Blizzard and Square Enix and Nintendo were there. Yeah, the, the console publishers. There was a bunch of console stuff, too. So there was a big Xbox gaming booth. There was a medium-sized PlayStation one. Nintendo one was really Nintendo big. Nintendo had a big one. But just a, more of a, a move towards streaming and yeah that and things like that over the publisher booths yeah i think the single biggest booth was probably twitch it was huge it was hard to tell because it was kind of like it was big it was open and there's a bunch of weird lounge areas and i think they were doing meet and greets or something with some top streamers maybe. yeah they're doing meet and greets oh there was i saw a streamer i follow did a video from like a tower inside the expo hall and it was for the people who make the streamer deck boxes, the the little, you know what I'm talking about, oh, where you hit a button, deck? the stream deck, deck. yeah, yeah, where he pushes a button and it makes it, some it makes us or... some kind of meme pop up, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apparently, they had a massive booth with like a streaming tower. Really? I yeah. Never saw that. So that was interesting. I got to play VR for kind of the first time. I've done a VR thing before, but it wasn't particularly good. But we demoed this little indie VR game. It was okay, but it was cool to to do VR. It was your first time, right? right it was Matt? my first time. That was my favorite thing that I did uh, video game wise. VR was really cool, even though I, like the graphics were very cartoony. I was just playing in the supermarket and I almost fell over because I wanted to pick something up that was on the other side of a counter. And I was so into it. You tried it. to lean on the counter? I, 
I just tried, I like basically dove over the counter and almost fell over. And some people behind me were like, whoa. Yeah, I did but the same thing. I, I tried it to, was great. <laughs> I tried to lean over the counter and like brace myself with my other hand. And then I realized that there was no counter to support my weight. Yeah, um, I, it was cool on Thursday that the lines were short enough. In VR, was, there were more like indie ish VR booths, I thought. So with the low lines on Thursday, you could actually try it without waiting an hour. Yeah, you tried a VR, right, Oren? Yeah, I found a little one along the edge somewhere that was like this Rube Goldberg machine simulation where you're trying to fix this, you know, you've got all these pieces and you're trying to put them back in the machine where they go. Uh, And yeah, the graphics weren't incredibly, I don't know, high res or something, but it was my first time doing VR and it was cool just to, I don't know, just experience it and then I got to switch over to like the free play room and you could just throw objects around and clone them and move them and whatever. So, yeah. We didn't get to play Catan VR though. Yeah. I, I had maybe an opportunity to, to demo Catan VR with some Asmodee people, but I really didn't <laughs> care. I guess that makes me a bad like board game media person, it but it does. does it? Yes. Well, that's on brand. <laughs> <laughs> I could see, I definitely could see how it could be really immersive, especially once they get the graphics maybe a little sharper and the more of a immersive sound. Because I was using yeah. this uh, Oculus goggles and I, I could cheap. still hear everyone around me and stuff. I want sheep but... noises <laughs> from Catan. Yeah. And when then... I roll like a 11 and I get four sheep, I want four sheep noises. I think you're, you're playing the game wrong. Two cities on an eleven sheep. sheep at a time. You have think... a poor strategy there, Goose. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Maybe those cities were also on a six brick and eight uh, stone or something. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to get into a Catan argument on my podcast. Aw, darn it! That's my new second objective behind making this a hockey podcast. Is making a Catan podcast? Yes. I succeeded last podcast. I second that. I will also try. The streak is at two. Oh, dear. <laughs> That's about all I did in with, re- with regards to the video games in the expo hall. I got to demo The Grim Forest, which is a new big game from I don't remember who, but I've seen it around quite a bit. And it was somewhat disappointing. We played like a third of a game. It was just this kind of... It was a blind bidding system in which to get resources and you're trying to build each of the houses from the the three pig story. So you're trying to gather brick, straw, and wood. And everyone blindly puts down what resource they want to gather. And then if you chose the same thing as someone else, you split it. And then there's like other action cards you can get that do various things. But overall, it looked really nice, but... It was fairly underwhelming as a game in the demo. I don't. I've, I've scratched that one off my mental list of games that had me mildly interested. It is now in the non list of games I'm not interested in at all. What else did I do in Expo stuff? In board gaming, oh, we looked at High Heavens, which looked intriguing, but then when we went back to demo it, I didn't find it that impressive well it's so it's uh what do you call those games like a tactical fighter yeah like a tactical hex minis game so okay so two things about it the theming was really cool basically each player plays a pantheon of gods so you can play the asgard gods or the egyptian gods or the greek gods and then i think there are some expansions and that's cool above average yeah it's, it's a promising theme for sure but then the disc stacking was maybe the innovative thing about it oh yeah it's still a great idea and i think it's a great yeah it's a great idea he had to do that tactical fighter you have health and armor and weapons and poison damage and other things like that and everything is represented by a colored disc that sits under the god that you move around it just makes it really easy to see what's going on on your... Yeah, it's, it's a great bit of visual design right. because if there's a whole bunch of health discs, they stand really tall and it means they have a lot of health. I'd like to see that sort of thing show up in other games, but honestly, I don't find that genre that interesting and this didn't stand out for me. Yeah, it. we played, we played over, I would say, we played like an abridged game. So like you're supposed to start at 30 health for your 
your side and we started at 15 but otherwise played a full game and it to me it seemed like it was a lot of just kind of throw in your guys against the other guys and then seeing what happened there wasn't a lot of space to maneuver it has the issue where at some point you have to like move in into the range of the other player and if you're the first to do that you're at a disadvantage because then they have the timing gain on attacking like you could move in and attack you got three actions per turn but if you're getting within range of the opponent's base you're probably getting you know you're getting like two to three people within range and not attacking or you're getting one person in range and doing one attack and then they're getting targeted by three people and there wasn't any real way around that i felt yeah and i mean there were some things that i thought might be promising strategically like uh health is a limited resource because every hit point is represented by a ring which you only have so many of but it ended up i you know i tried to manipulate that and i don't know how interesting it actually would be but i don't know well it also had the issue of that we that we highlighted with rising sun of kind of a light game with lots of different abilities going around and while the visualization of the health and the armor was great on the rings all the special abilities of all the different gods you were playing out are still on cards and it was difficult, first of all, to remember what god was which because they were all roughly the same size sculpts. And, you know, you kind of have to know or memorize which ones match up with, with, with which god. Some of them are easy. Thor, you could tell, was Thor. I, I think. could not tell that Thor was Thor. Really? He had a cape and flowing hair and was raising a hammer. It was I definitely Thor. You, who is that? Oh, okay. Well, I thought the Thor one was the most distinct of all of them. But you still had to ask all the time in the first game, at least, what does that god do? What's the range on that one? And in a game that doesn't seem like it promises a ton of depth, that's a little bit annoying. I can I can forgive that more if the game felt like it was going to be really, really good once you knew the cards. But I did not get that impression from the game. It seemed interesting. It looked cool. But... Uh, it, it didn't excite me enough to, to keep being interested in it. The final thing I got from the Expo Hall is that someone who I've interacted before on Twitter named Chip, and I cannot pronounce his last name, I apologize if you're listening, said, hey, come on over, I have a booth with some games I'm going to show you, and he has designed a couple of what are called wallet games from Buttonshy Publishing, and he demoed them to us, and they were kind of interesting. So there's these games that fit... They're micro games like Love Letter, and they fit into a little like bifold wallet thing. And so each of the games is like 15 to 18 cards or something, and we he showed us two of them. So the first one was called Smoke and Daggers. It's a little bluffing game. I would say kind of a similar feel to Love Letter. But Smoke and Mirrors? Smoke and Mirrors, sorry. Did I say something else? Smoke and Daggers. Anyway, it has kind of a similar feel to Love Letter with a little bit of bluffing, kind of easy card play, but I kind of liked it a bit more i think so you have three small decks of cards it's kind of like the old uh card game bs that i used to play I, I haven't played that oh it's it's a sim you have a when that you have a hand of like playing cards and you go around and you have you have a number and you're trying to say i have you know two threes and then someone calls you on it and if you're lying then you have to take the whole pile and if you're not they have to take the whole pile okay um yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's that like idea. A micro version of that, and then it's just you you play some number of cards face down, and then you say this is this totals four, and the next person has to either call you on it or you know pass, and then they have to play five, and then six, and so on. Yeah, you have to go in consecutive numerical order. But the the cool thing is that there are three mini decks, and one of them with three different backs, so you can see which cards people are playing. One of them has all ones and a mirror card. One card is all ones, another deck is all fives, and another deck is one of each number from one to five. Yeah, and all three of them have also one card that's a mirror, so it'll copy another card played with it. Yeah. So just by looking at the backs of the cards, you have some idea of what the numbers could be. Plus, you have information, especially with the middle deck that has numbers one through five, you know what card of that deck you have, which gives you a bit more information. But there was a surprising amount of 
depth put into the bluffing if he really wanted to play it well because you have to sit there and kind of remember what card people were claiming they had before with the middle deck and see if that story has changed throughout their bluffing. Yeah, yeah I, don't I thought it was fun. I thought it was clever. It was clever and fun. 18 cards that fits in your wallet, but yeah, it was fun. Yeah. The other one, which we haven't played a proper game of, is called Universal Rule, and that is an 18-card 4X space game, which actually promises to maybe feel kind of like a 4X. We haven't played a full game. We got a short demo of it, but I am intrigued by the idea. It seemed like it kind of feels like Cosmic Encounter with the fact that you can jump into and help out in battles, which but could be interesting. Without all the weird, crazy powers. Yeah, without all the weird, crazy powers. But you can also like build planets and develop them and all that <laughs> good 4X stuff to create kind of an economic engine. Yeah, when I heard 18 card 4X, I was skeptical like probably most people. But it, I don't know, we played two rounds and it seemed interesting. Yeah, so uh, I ended up getting those two games and we'll play and review them probably fairly soon since they're so simple to get out and play. That's the convenience of having a game fit into a wallet. Anything else from the Expo Hall, either the video game or tabletop side you guys found noteworthy? Just that there's way too many people there to do anything on Friday or Saturday. So in the future, if you wanted to do Expo Hall stuff, I would say go on the first day or the last day. Yeah, Thursday I think is the way to go for sure. Let's move on and talk about some unpublished games, games that are not available in the market that we were able to play, which is exciting. Every year at PAX East, there's more and more support from board game publishers. This year, we got a larger Asmodee booth. We got an entire Unpub section, so by the the organization Unpub, which helps people play test their designs at, at conventions all across the nation and there were a good what six tables for that and then probably what 30 tables 20 to 30 tables of either new games or games that are just about to come out so for instance restoration had fireball island their mock-up of it and the new downforce expansions and a couple of you guys got to play the downforce expansions i did not but what did you guys think yeah, Lindsay, I'm interested to hear what you think, because that was also your first time playing Downforce. Yes, it was my first time playing Downforce in general, but I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then uh, some of you guys had explained to me how the game was before without the expansion, and I think that this is like a, a really great improvement upon it. But I really like the game. Like, I think it's I like to refer a lot of games to as like things my parents would play. And I think it's a game, like, I could get my parents to play. Like, they like Ticket to Ride, like Catan, like Pandemic, things like that. So it's super easy to learn. Like, I got it, you know, you can get it within, like, 5, 10 minutes of actually playing the game. I like that you actually get to play, like, four other people. So you're only in control of your destiny so much. Like, I can do all that I can do. But at the end of the day, you know, if, if Matt is playing with me, one of them or both of them, then they can, you know, kind of ruin my plan with what they're with what they have so i like that um element to it and then i like the the betting because no matter how much strategy you know you really have you kind of have to be able to um predict things as well so i like the game i liked how they added a rocky section to the board i don't know how specific you want me to get like on what the board kind of looks like but it made it so that passing like other cars on the board was kind of difficult so you could still accomplish a goal you needed to do but you were just going to get there really slowly and it also um kind of made it so that other people or that you could block other people really well from doing things so i like the game a lot i would definitely play it again yeah in comparison to the the original those rocky spots are really cool i think because it, it's like a soft bottleneck which worked really well i made the choice a couple of times to burn movement in order to go through the rocks you know which is a decision you make and it, it sucks because you're losing movement points but it's not impossible so it's just a cool variation on one of well i guess both of the tracks in the original have like true bottlenecks where there's only one path like if you felt like you had played the original like too much and you kind of knew how every way possibly could go like i feel like this threw a really nice spin on it and made it so you could have a lot more playability out of the original game and then i like you said i actually had to use my strongest card while I was going through a rocky area. 
which was, you know, unfortunate, but there was like no other choice that I had besides to do that. So it makes you play things that you wouldn't necessarily do and without those. Yeah, it's interesting. What? How were the new powers? Did you guys play with those? Yes. Yeah, we did. They were they were fine. I think at least situationally, a few of them felt overpowered, or more powerful than any of the the ones in the base game. And uh, there was one that I misunderstood, so I picked it, and then it was almost worthless. Really? What was it? It was if you don't move on your turn. If none of your cars move on your turn, move one of your cars three. Oh, that's interesting. It's interesting, but if your cards are such that you're not going to move your own cars, you're not going to want to bet on them anyway, because you know that you're not going to move them. So you don't want that extra movement. But but Geisman, But it not, lets you pivot. It lets you pivot into a plan of betting and boosting someone else's car while still maybe squeezing out some points from your own. It's just that I think it's rare that you have so few cards that can move your own cars anyway. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know. It's interesting. I think it opens up new and different strategies. So what I think you failed to mention is that you had two cars in this game. And you're not always going to have two cars. I think that power is much more powerful when you only have one car. That would be, that's 100% true. Well, you're going to use it a lot more. I don't know. I'm still skeptical whether you'd actually want to use it. I, I feel like the situations that you would be using it more are situations you wouldn't want to. But I don't know. It, it is interesting. And it would be worth You know, I, I'd try it again to see if I could swing it. Yeah, yeah. But... Yeah, no, 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 but some of the other powers were cool. There was a drafting, uh, you know. That was like... the best power, in my opinion. Like, I think that neither you or I really utilized ours. I didn't think my power was that great either. But that David, the other player, his the, with the drafting power, like you said, I think that that was probably, as long as you have two cars, I think that that's the best, the best oh, power. He, he positioned game. his cars so well so that oh, when, when cars in front of him moved, they got to follow a space. Oh, nice. He probably got like a dozen extra spaces in the game. He he really did it well. So, summary of the Downforce expansion, new maps, yay? It, it's what you want out of an expansion. <laughs> it's more Downforce with a cool twist on it. It looks great. We only played the one side. The other side looks great, too. It's, it's more like tron feeling. This was like Race Through the Desert. That's cool. Another game we got to play that I believe has been successfully funded on Kickstarter and now is taking other pre-orders is Tokyo Metro. Oh boy. And I had vaguely heard of this game before and we were kind of drawn to it by its very interesting looking board, which is actually made of cloth. This was the game that I kept passing every day or a couple times a day and looking at it. I was like, I have to play that. Yeah, because it's this white cloth with, I suppose, the entire Tokyo Metro metro system printed on it. Very complex. It looks really cool. Yeah, and it's, I believe, a variation on the classic 18xx train games, except, and I may be entirely wrong here because I've never played an 18xx game or Steam or something like that, but I believe in those games you're constructing the routes as well as owning shares in the various rail companies in this one you're physically moving a piece around tokyo and building stations on the routes already there while also investing in the various metro lines and it had a cool kind of worker placement system for action selection i didn't like the graphic design on that very well it looked stark but it was difficult to kind of decipher what the various actions were because they were on cards and the only indication of what kind of action it was was the background pattern of the card and it was all very bright like almost neon colors they were all very distinct uh, colors that popped and there were 12 actions all with different colors which is a little overwhelming um and then 12 action types right 12 action types. Yeah. And well, so, And also, oh no, I guess the grid is 15 different spots. Yeah, so when you look at that grid of possible actions, it's just a lot of colors, and you're looking back at your reference board, 
to remember what the different things do. I love the, what would you call that? The worker placement? Yeah, it's a worker placement. It's a worker placement, but it's unique in that the actions come from these five decks. So you have three rows of five actions available, and then they cycle. So a row disappears, and then the next row comes out each round. I thought it was really cool. And you end up, we both quickly got like six workers, and we're probably get to nine fairly quickly so that was actually my favorite part of the game was the kind of expansive worker placement aspect yeah and in terms of a stock game it was i felt appropriately tight with the money in that you always felt like you did not have enough money but after playing we played what two out of six rounds of the game After playing that second round, I kind of started to understand how I could gain money. But it's daunting at first because you start with only like $2,000. And there aren't that many ways to actually gain money because you want to invest in companies that are going to do well. And it's the kind of game where there's a a stock price and you invest in it and that raises the, the price of what it'll pay out at the end of the game for points. But you don't really gain any passive income from owning shares in companies. You only are getting end game money. And so you had to really be careful with how you were spending your money because you were going to run out really quick. Yeah. I'd have to play it again to have much more to say. I'll, I'll just say that it looks really cool on that alone. I kind of want it. (laughs) Yeah. It has an interesting look to it. The cloth board. And I think that the, the action, colors that pop are really cool but if train games are like that we got to get into them sometime i think this is a lighter version of that genre i think this is a much simpler kind of gateway version and yeah i completely agree if this is this is what the train game thing is is about i'm on board Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and finally the last one that we played was a game called faza which is a, a prototype in the unpub section that we played around with and it was think of like forbidden desert but more complicated and more difficult but the same kind of tile grid and kind of economizing your actions in a full co-op game and more combative yes because the idea is that you're in the middle of an alien invasion and it's got this like 30s 40s pulp sci-fi look to it And there are three motherships and you're trying to defeat them all uh, before they kind of blow up everything or kill you. And I thought it was pretty good. The designer said that he is going to try to be on Kickstarter with it by the end of the year. Hopefully we gave him some good advice in terms of balance issues and playtest issues. But I had fun with it. It was certainly a meatier co-op than it looked. Yeah, no, I... Pretty much echo that. It was definitely still under development and he was tweaking things. And we, I think we found some spots where you could run into issues and maybe ways to tweak that. But uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see where it goes. I have to say this was one of my favorite things that I did at PAX. The, the unpub section was just so cool. Bubba, you talked earlier about wanting to talk to developers <laughs> in unpub. It was just developers who hadn't finished their games wanting to see people play their games so, yeah, Faza, the art was surprisingly awesome for something that's not finished. And there were cl- he's clearly got some work to do on it, but, but there's a solid game in there, I think. But it was just really fun to play through probably half the game and then brainstorm with him kind of what changes would have to be made, where the problems were. Yeah, I mean, he had, I think, a solid game, and most of what he needed to work on were difficulty balancing issues yeah the difficulty power curve stuff for sure and 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 that's really what we talked about with him you know he, he said you know i i tweaked this thing but un, un you know the unintended consequence was that you didn't have resources in this area and it's a it's a different way to think about game design than when we're critiquing games that are already out i love that that's a part of pax i think that's the best part as well i think getting to play new games and try new things and actually talk to the people who want you to play them with it. I think that's my favorite part as well. Yeah, That actually kind of ties into one of the few panels we went to. Yeah, about game balance and play testing. Yeah. And analytics. That, but except not really. Not <laughs> yeah, at all it was titled analytics, analytics and I there was that? far too I little math. I missed that part, guys. I missed that part. <laughs> oh, you were on your phone for that part. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Yeah, did you look at the first screen, uh, the first slide? I think that's where the analytics were. 
Oh, okay. All right, I must have missed it. I was too busy. Anyway, yeah, it was a game. It was a talk titled "Board Game Analytics." I don't remember Crunching the subtitle. Crunching the cardboard. Crunching the cardboard, and there was there's a lot of talk about how to play test and balance games, but no analytics, sadly. I'll say this: the talks excited me way less this time around from last year. This was the only one I went to, other than the Penny Arcade stuff. Yeah, I think for me, my bar for talks has gotten higher because they're so frequently disappointing at at the PAX events, especially PAX East. With the video game stuff, I found that it tended to be a little bit too casual and, hey, we're meeting our fans, which is great for those fans. But if I want to like learn about a topic, it doesn't help if it's a community event. Yeah, um, I, I tend to go in expecting to learn something almost more like you know, a college seminar, and it's more just a couple people who are involved in this thing generally talking about it, which is fine and interesting, but it's not something that I would go out of my way to do probably in the future. Yeah. PAX people listening, we want more talks that feel like college seminars. I just, I want to go to a <laughs> No, I, 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 I'm only slightly joking. Smarter. I completely agree with you. I want it to be, well, the, historically, and I didn't see it on the schedule, but there's always been a statistics of video games talk at PAX East, and it was full of data. It was full oh, of yeah. information we went and to that graphs. Last year and the, he was like a new graph every twenty seconds, and we you couldn't even see them all. He was he had so much. It was so good. Oh, just graph after graph after graph. <laughs> so much say about us. <laughs> That's what we want. We just want graphs. We want information density in these talks. I and love pie charts. I much prefer those. You prefer pie charts? Pie charts are great. because yeah, I'm a baker, you know. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Do they have brownie charts? Oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I didn't find this talk particularly interesting. There was there were a couple of cool anecdotes, but not much really to say about game balance. I don't know. What did you think, Bubba? Yeah, I found his stories about like when he started talking about his current game design kind of interesting. He was one of the, he's the one of the designers on the team for the new legacy game based on BHH. Sorry, Betrayal on House on Hill or something like that. Betrayal uh, at House on the Hill. I never know what the actual title is. I call it BHH. Yes, that's easier. <laughs> so he obviously wasn't allowed to talk about too much, but those, when he got into like stories about that development specifically, I was interested. Outside of that, though, I, I didn't really learn much. Very, very similar to what Orion was saying about how I go into these like expecting to learn something, and I don't feel like I did. Yeah, it wasn't bad, but I don't remember that much from it. Did you get to ask a question at the end, or did you not? I was it? going to because they talked a lot about game balance, and I was a little bit frustrated at them conflating the idea of a balance game and a good game. Because they kept saying, or they kept mentioning like a balance game, what they meant was a game that's interesting. They meant, oh yeah, and their cause definitions like, were bad. They meant a game that's fun. Yes, because they mentioned right off the bat like, oh, Tic-Tac-Toe's not a balance game. And I'm like, Tic-Tac-Toe's a perfectly balanced game. No, their definition of balance was tic -tac -toe right, is, a game with the right number of choices. Which is just wrong. That's just not what balanced means. Yeah, Tic-tac-toe is it, the most honestly, balanced game you can have. If both players play well, it is a tie every single time. Yeah, there were... There That's were, the definition of a balanced game. There were interesting <laughs> anecdotes in this talk. I pulled out a couple of tidbits that I'll hold on to, but I was not impressed at all. Yeah, anyway, I was going to ask about their perception of balance as it relates to a learning curve. Like... What does it mean if a game, if statistically, say, each faction in your game wins an equal amount of times the first two plays of a game, but then they become unequal after everyone's on their 10th play or vice versa? If it's unequal on the first couple of plays, but becomes balanced when everyone is more familiar with the game. And... I was going to ask them a question about that idea and see what they thought about it, because I think a lot of designers and publishers and developers prefer the first scenario where the game feels balanced on the first couple of plays, but ultimately isn't, to the latter. 
just because I think that's how the incentives line up because people don't play games a lot over and over. They kind of play it once or twice and then move on. And sadly, I was like second in line when the time ran out. I suspect at least two of the four on the panel might have preferred the unbalanced game that seems balanced at first. But I don't know. Well, I I mean, the game they talked about the most was Betrayal and House of the Hill, which is like the game where balance matters least. Yeah, it's the game where it's not even a concept (laughs) of the game, really. I mean, I would argue that like co-op game balance is probably an advanced topic in, you know, in the conversation about what a balance game is. Well, it's a different question with co-op. With with a co-op, it's how what percentage you want your players to win at. In some games, you want them to win more. In some games, you want them to win less. And that's just kind of a choice you have to make. The problem Didn't with, he also w- talk about how much he hated... Was it Great Western Trail? Was that what it was? <laughs> the, yeah. The designer of yeah, was, Kingdom that was, that was Death Monster. That well. was just his hatred for that game. That was somewhat amusing. <laughs> Anyways, I ducked out a little early with uh, Lindsay and Matt to go over to Jimmy John's. For Jimmy lunch. John's? <laughs> oh, are we going to talk about Jimmy John's? Hashtag give me a number on my order. <laughs> Okay, yes. Talk, let's speak about bad design. Yeah, let's. <laughs> There's a Jimmy John's across the street from the convention center, and they're a sub-sandwich company. Let's let's make a hallway wide enough for one and a half people, and then let's put a door in the middle on the long end. Yes. And then dozens of people will go in that door, and then have to, like... If I don't know what words for the people, motion I'm yeah, doing. Like, He's turning hard. sideways and like flailing his hands a little bit. As yeah, if for those who aren't watching. <laughs> and then and then they take my order and I'm like, are you going to give me a receipt with a number on it or ask for my name? No, just go stand wherever you want. And then randomly, like 15 minutes later, my sandwich shows up on the opposite side of this hallway. Okay, here's what happened to me. I ordered a roast beef sandwich. Great. And I stand, I finally squeeze my way through this snaking line that's one and a half people wide, but is comprised of two people wide smashed together. I squeeze in the middle of that to wait by the counter where my sandwich is going to be done. The guy at the end of the line puts down a sandwich. I don't remember what he's called out. He called out something. And he said, with with mustard and pickles. I'm like, oh, I ordered mine with mustard and pickles. But he didn't say roast beef. And so I wait there a little while, and who was with me at that point who ordered right I was. next to me? Oh, that was you, Bubba. Yeah. Yes. And you got yours. I got mine just fine. And we were right next to each other in line, so I'm, I'm standing there thinking, maybe that is my sandwich. And I pick up, I, I walk over to the counter, pick up the sandwich, and what he had called out was the brand of the roast beef they use. I, it, it was like he set it down and yelled boar's head. It wasn't boar's head, but that's effectively what he did. How on earth am I supposed to know the brand <laughs> of the John, roast beef I ordered? Listen up, Jimmy John. Yes, listen. I don't care how you do this. Just put a system in place so that people know when their order is up. You could implement that in so many different ways. And you could do it in a mediocre way and we'll all be happy. Yeah. Just put some system in place so that I get my sandwich. The silver lining in all this is that Lindsay knows all about sandwich shops. She gamed the system. For gamed sure. the system and got me a second sandwich. And so... <laughs> really? Whoa, 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 whoa. Altered, I didn't hear about this. All told, it's probably fine. Wait, what'd you do, Lindsay? I did get him a second sandwich. This is a fact. <laughs> what'd you do? I just started being bossy. And I went up to the counter because they neither of them had gotten... Neither Orion or... Uh, Matt got their sandwiches and like I think people were just taking sandwiches and no one had, had any idea of the counter so I just said hey they haven't gotten their sandwiches yet and then they asked what did they get and I listed it off and then they made me immediately two sandwiches so then about that time I realized that my sandwich was all the way down on the other end of that hallway that's only wide enough for one and a half people but there are about three people across on it so I go all the way down there and find my sandwich that has been sitting there. And it wasn't even my sandwich. It was someone else's sandwich that ordered a similar sandwich. And probably didn't understand what they yelled out. I could go on and on about this. But anyway. I'm still mad about the brand name thing. I picked up that sandwich, left, and then Lindsay's like, here, I got your sandwich. On the plus side, they were pretty good, I thought. completed the ad for them? What's that? Should we let Subway know that we completed the ad ad for them on the podcast? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Subway's all right. 
Quiznos is disgusting. But we have a couple blocks from our house, Bob's, a local place. If you're ever in Medford, they've got the Primo sandwiches. They're the best. Even if you're not in Medford, just fly in for Bob's. Yeah, if you're within... People drive from Vermont. To go to Bob's, yeah. To go to Bob's. We're we're hashtag blessed over here. What were you talking... Oh, board games. Now I'm really (laughs) hungry, and I had a Bob's sandwich for lunch. Is that a sub podcast? I was pretty sure after listening to this. What are your opinions on Subway, Lindsay? Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, I, you kind of uh, work for they, them, they're huh? They're great. They're great. Is that your public statement? That is my public as, a, <laughs> as someone who has Subway as a client, <laughs> quote, they're great. <laughs> Frosted <Fresh>. flakes. <laughs> okay, so we finished the talk, and then we went back to play more games. Yes, more games. So... For the rest of this podcast, I put the games, the rest of the games we played, or at least that I played in, in, well, uh, did I play all these? Yes, all of these are games that I played. So if any of you want to talk about a different game, just speak up at some point. No, it's a, it's a Mark is selfish list. Yeah, that's, it's my podcast. That's on brand. (laughs) And I put them roughly in order from what I thought was worst to best, roughly. There was one game that none of you liked, so I knocked it down a bit to to be nice. Let's start with Merlin, the new Stefan Feld game that Orion and I played on Sunday, and was kind of underwhelming, I thought. It was all right. Yeah, it was all right. I mean, it felt like a Feld. Everything you did gave you victory points. Uh, there were You were rolling dice to know which actions you got, and instead of choosing tiles like in uh, castle burgundy you are moving your little figure around this rondelle mark tells me it's called yes it's a rondelle circular action track and it it was fine but nothing amazing yeah it never felt like you were doing anything exciting and like okay you could say that about a lot of his games but here even more so it was like well i can do this thing and get a point or i can do this other thing and get a point I, I just I think the criticism I would say is that in Castles of Burgundy you roll dice and you might get stuck with bad numbers, but there are multiple ways to use those dice. And in this, you roll your dice and you move your figure that many spaces and you take that action. Yeah, the only decision you have is in what order you use the the three dice for your figure. Yeah. And so that can uh, modify like which actions you get a little bit, but for the most part, you know, if you roll a two, four, and six, you know, you're doing those three actions. Yeah, and the problem I found was that there are certain there. The idea is that there are these like six factions you're getting influence in and getting support from and such, and each of them have a main section where you can get one of the four resources from that faction and that seen that was having resources seemed like a prerequisite for so many of the other things that if you got stuck not being able to land on those spaces it hurt a lot yeah and the other thing which is maybe just me wanting to have a more efficient economy engine in a uh, euro game but you could only move in one direction and so You'd land on a space and you'd choose which of the four things you wanted and you wanted all of them. And then you'd go on and you'd probably not hit the next one and then maybe you'd get the one after that. So each time around the circle you hit two to three of those spaces. If you roll well. I don't don't think I did. I don't think I was close to that at all. And I think you get, what, six turns? So you move around, depending on what you roll, maybe about twice. So... Unless you, you have to use the, the flags where really where playing well comes in because those kind of give you bonus actions, I think. Yeah, and maybe my problem was that I didn't use the flags because they give you kind of efficiency, but you have to use up a whole die to get them in the first place. I don't know. It felt like there was a lot of art and a lot of visual busyness and a lot of little, you know, there were, what, 10 different types of actions or eight different types of actions. And... Ultimately, your decisions were like, again, well, I can get one point this way or I can get one point this other way. Yeah, I can go three spaces and then five or I can go five spaces and then three more. So either way, I'm landing eight spaces from here. And it's just do I want the three or the five? When I when I looked at that, because it was in that new game section, 
which was so awesome. And I, when we went down the row and I looked at it, I could not believe it was by the same person who made Castles in Burgundy because it looks great. I think Castles <laughs> of Burgundy is visually a better game than Merlin. This had brighter colors. I would say this game had better art, but I wouldn't say it was... I, wouldn't, I mean, I didn't I wouldn't play s- the game, so I, don't, I have no idea how the graphic design I wouldn't was. say the design to look at it, it helped better. your experience of the game. It was a little bit too busy for me. I just played my favorite Steffenfeld game, Castles of Burgundy, the card game. You played two-fifths of the game. We're going to finish it after this podcast is done. You really like it that much so far? No, I just don't like Castles of Burgundy. Why not? I thought you liked it the first time we played it. It's fine. <laughs> 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 is it fine. more or less fine than Mage Knight? Less fine. Less fine. <laughs> no, probably more fine. More fine. I don't know. It's equally fine. <laughs> it's fine. Fine. Not compare too vast. Anyway, if you, I, I think if you want to play a Stefan Feld game with a lot of tons of Stefan Feldy goodness, kind of manipulating a circular track, then Trajan's the way to go. Still, and I want to play that, but I didn't get to at. Whenever you played it, I honestly, I, I think Trajan's all right. I think it's kind of interesting. I, I, I think Castles of Burgundy is still my favorite Feld, but in terms of the feeling, this one felt more like Trajan. Just you did far less, and it was the things you did were less interesting. Moving on, the next thing I have on the list is the Munchkin collectible card game, the new game by Kevin Wilson, and hey, I forgot to mention this to you guys by Eric Lang. Ooh, he co-designed it with Kevin Wilson. And again, it seemed all right. I played a little quick demo of it. Bubby, you liked it a lot, didn't didn't you? I did. I actually wanted to hear more about what you thought because I asked you and I got a eh, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I mean, the jokes on it are pretty funny and clever, like better, I think, than what I remember of the original Munchkin game. The gameplay was, I think... The basic systems of the game could be interesting if you got some ability to deck build a lot. Because I'm playing with, you know, the pre-constructed demo deck and there didn't seem to be really energy, any synergy in that deck. And it was just all the actions were kind of basic. In terms of like the monsters, the, the, the difficulty or like the complexity level seemed on par with like early Hearthstone. Even even in that there was a card that was exactly Chillwind Yeti. You know, a monster with no effect, four attack, and five defense. So it reminded me kind of of that, but there's this little bluffing game going on because you present the monsters face down and then you put what you're paying for them on top of the card. And then you could underpay and basically bluff it out or, you know, actually have the, the amount that the monster costs. And then the other person has to either accept the attack basically and then you flip it over and see if you're bluffing or not or they can run away once per turn in which case they skip it and it goes back into this pool that kind of cycles back into your hand i yeah, think it seems I, I probably like probably had a, kind of like a an ideal scenario in the time i played it where my hand was a bunch of two cost monsters and then one big three cost monster so like my entire turns were trying to bluff that I was playing this big high attack three cost monster over and over again until I actually got it to hit, which was, I I enjoyed it a lot because of that. But I also could see why your game was not so good. I also think the person you were playing against had a really crappy hand. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't don't know. know. I I feel like... I would need to see like a a competitive game and see what kind of what kind of decks are being built, like wh- what the creativity level is like for different strategies before I would get excited about it. But honestly, given that it's a CCG, I'm just not going to get into it anyway because I don't get into collectible. I, I I don't ever want to get stuck in a randomized booster pack kind of thing. Yep, I hear you. So I don't even consider those kinds of games. But as they go, it seemed. Again, on the level of Hearthstone, it seemed all right in that sense. Next yep. next on the list is Civilization and New Dawn, the new Civ game from Fantasy Flight, which presents kind of a streamlined take on the old Civilization games, which I've only heard about in Myth and Legend. Because you guys played, like, what, an eight-hour game of the original Sid Meier's Civ? It was 
I don't even remember. It was absurd. <laughs> we, we were, it was in college and it was like the study day and we started too late. And then I think we played until like three in the morning or five in the morning or I don't even remember. Anyway, the new one is it's certainly streamlined. We finished in what, two hours maybe? We were also playing two player, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's quick. And I wasn't terribly impressed there were parts that I liked. I liked the action, the, the way you chose actions. Basically, you had this track numbered one through five, and you had five categories of actions. And when you played a card, you took it from its slot and put it down in the bottom and then shifted everything up and put it in the number one slot. And it was more powerful based on how high on the track it was. So some things let you go over more difficult terrain or gave you more attack power or gave you more tech points or whatever. So in the sense of kind of managing an economic engine, thinking about the ordering of what you wanted to do was, I thought that was clever. And, yeah, that was certainly the highlight of the game. Uh, and then the way as you got in tech, you basically leveled up those different actions with a age two, three, and four versions of them. So you got two of from each age and you had to kind of choose which actions you wanted to upgrade so i thought that part was cool i wasn't a huge fan of how the board worked and the tech dial itself was underwhelming yeah so there's this one of the five basic actions is technology and basically you invest points into it and at certain points on this dial you get new cards which are better versions of the cards you already have but both of us maxed it out fairly trivially in the middle of the game, and then tech suddenly wasn't really a thing much anymore. It seemed like you should have been able to do more with that. I don't know. Yeah, I think it should have... I guess it's probably part of them trying to streamline the game, but it felt like tech should have been more difficult or had more effects or more modifiers or something. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm just trying to make a more complex Civ game. I just thought of this, and let me know if you agree. This is my theory. I feel like they took a standard Civ game, they kept in the beginning game and the end game, and then just kind of cut out the middle game. Like, you ramped up so fast in terms of your abilities and what you could do in terms of expansion. And then all of a sudden you're fighting over the endgame conditions. That's what it felt like to me. I could see some of that. I think some of that's also, it was the first time we had played the game. And just that we were figuring it out. And then suddenly we had this cool level four action. And we're like, wow, I can do this crazy strong thing. Yeah, I'm not excited to play it again necessarily. I would play it again, especially with more players. Because obviously in this kind of game, a two player game isn't ideal. And there were some clever ideas with multiple players or with three or four players the the diplomacy stuff would be more interesting in the trade but ultimately i think if you want the feeling of building up and like really crunchy tactical decisions through the ages is still better and if you want more kind of a traditional civ game i felt like there were more interesting things in clash of cultures so both of those kind of exceeded this Civ. Although, we, we currently have two Civ games on our shelves we haven't played yet, so maybe we should make a priority to get those played, and then I could do some kind of ultimate Civ game ranking. We could do a Civ game podcast. Ah, there we go. Yeah, we've got Nations and Mari Nostrum Empires. The next game on the list is Dice Forge, and this is one of the first games we played at PAX. It is the 2017 game from a person whose name I can't remember, but it's the same guy who made Seasons, which I liked all right, but... More than I liked. Yeah, you guys didn't like it, so I ended up getting rid of it. I think I like Dice Forge a little bit better. I think it's a little simpler and kind of a fun... It's a deck builder, but you're using dice instead of cards, essentially. And you're actually constructing the faces of your deck dice that you're rolling throughout the game but it, it gives you that sense of progression and increasing your resources and trying to use that to swap it in for victory points in a pretty simple format i enjoyed it it was a fun positive feedback loop yeah every turn every <laughs> every turn you got to roll dice and you got resources and then you buy better dice and you get more resources and then you buy victory points and unless then... you roll like i rolled unless... and then you just continually get two gold the entire game 
<laughs> but you still won, didn't you? Or you know, you lost by one point to Mark. Or Something like I that. I lost by one point to one of you. Okay, yeah, you, you lost by one to Mark then. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the best way to put it. It's a nice, pleasant, positive feedback loop. You just kind of get stronger, and then you buy cool stuff, and yeah. then you buy points, and then the game's over, and it's bright and colorful and looks great. It was the right length. Yeah, not too long. Just pleasant and enjoyable is how I would put it, I suppose. And if you like those games where you, you know, in like, what, hour-ish, probably? I feel like, other than the time you waste trying to pop faces of the die off, you can play it in like 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Or if you spill all of the extra die faces and have to resort them. Oh man, set up, (laughs) first time set up for that game was half the length of the game itself, I felt like. The rule book, which was actually like this rule poster that you unfolded, was not helpful for setup and made the game way more complicated than it actually is. It's a pretty light game. I don't know. Part of me kind of thinks that after playing this game half a dozen times, the game is 90% how you roll on the die. That's probably true, but I still But on the other hand, it's cool. Like, we played... Our game was fun, but I think we used a third of the cards, so there's a lot of swapping in and out. Of no, the... we used like 60%. 60%. Okay, yeah. so there's some swapping in and out of the cards, which give you bonuses. So that's cool. Yeah, so it, along those lines... It's the best lines... implementation of like actually editing dice as you go that I've played. I think it's the first game where you actually edit your dice. Probably, but I've thought about it. Like, I believe be he cool. got the patent on it, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, on yeah. that, on it's the good. physical object, yeah. It's good. Yeah, so if you're a fan of those kind of medium light euros, uh, this was a pleasant one. I enjoyed it. Next is a game that I had no clue existed until we randomly stumbled upon it. And at that point, it was clear that it existed. Yes, once we physically touched it and handled it. Did, Orion, did you lick it? Uh, no. So we, we can't haven't be licked sure. it. We so can't be sure that it's actually a game. Yeah, that's that's our new. We need more that's, empirical. That's, we need empirical proof. Yeah, our method of positivism is lick based it used to be touch based but uh I believe someone Wes upgraded it that it be upgraded yeah to, uh, you just ask taste. the question and what are the characteristics that you have to find when you look at it? you, you find whether or not it exists you, get the center of the game? You, you find you find proof of its very existence yeah. does it taste like existence or non-existence Lindsay? Well, what yeah. does, does your tongue taste dissolve like? into antimatter or is it still there i mean mm. that's pretty straightforward yeah. i think so yeah. this is our epistemology. Um, <laughs> uh, have you ever Wes... baked a brownie, Lindsay, and then found that it 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 didn't exist? I've never baked a brownie before. Wow, that's that's how an is, impressive. How is that possible? Um, you know, I just just avoided them my whole life. She has standards, Ryan. Are brownies like inherently box based? What do you mean box based? I mean, like, if like, you put them in one, like you, they come in a mix. Rather than something made from scratch, or I don't know what bakers do. Yeah, I think all brownies I mean, come in a box. You could put it in a can if you really wanted to. It, it's box or can. But bakers look down upon brownies. No, I, I make brownies all the time. <laughs> uh, Wes is uh, watching this podcast actually, and has commented that it is in fact "lingento ergo sum" <laughs> in Latin. Is that "I lick, therefore I am"? Yeah, yeah. What is? It would be no. It would have to. Wes, it'd have to be. I lick, therefore it is. Yeah, or I am licked, therefore I am. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what he wrote. Conjugate that for us and uh, reply back. Watching the podcast is actually a feature of our Patreon. How about that? Uh, what am I doing? Okay. You can't say how about that segue every time you bring up the it's Patreon. It's not a segue. It was, it was shameless pandering. So if shameless you want pandering. to actually watch us make all these terrible jokes before Mark edits them out, you can check him out on Patreon at uh, The Thoughtful Gamer. <laughs> oh gosh, this is going far off the rails. Oh, we're going to talk about a game called The Shipwreck Arcana. That, yes, that definitely exists. That does exist. We've played it a few times. And we went to this booth and there was no one there. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to talk to the people here. And it was a little indie tabletop booth. And they had a couple of games. But this one really stood and, out. And by because they, you mean the two, two brothers. men who were clearly brothers. Yes. And this game really stood out because of the, frankly, beautiful, stark artwork 
I think I am a sucker for anything with a white background. And this has the pure white background with a nice, almost, the art on the cards is almost stained glass-like. It almost. Is, yeah. yeah. It's got that feel to it, and it's just beautiful. But what it is is a cooperative, mathy deduction game. And how it works... It's more logic deduction than math, but... Yeah, logic, logical deduction. Assuming that you can do simple factorizations up to seven. Right. If you can name all the primes to 100, you can beat this game. <laughs> okay. So it's easy. Yeah, it's super... It's a breeze. Actually, I haven't actually lost a single round I in this game no you gotta make it harder yeah have you only played one round i played twice and both times we never lost a round i played with matt and we lost oh yeah we lost the game that's shameful aren't you guys supposed to be good at math yeah to be fair i misread something oh you're good at math but not reading true facts (laughs) i i made an implication based on lines of that I was thinking along and he was thinking along different lines and did not. But ultimately you were right and I was wrong. But and that's the cool part of it. Yeah. Is that it's a deduction game, but there are implications. Like, you... <laughs> <laughs> the way you say that. <laughs> Sorry, I can't say... <laughs> For any people who have seen the TV show, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, you can never think or say of the word implications the same <laughs> ever again. The funniest scene in that entire show deals with that word. Anyway, do have any of you seen that scene that I'm talking no. about? No, I, I okay. specifically went and watched it, and it is, well, it's kind of disturbing, but it's also it's funny. It's incredibly disturbing, but that whole show is... Okay, <laughs> how the game works is that there's a bag full of these tokens, and there are three copies of the numbers one through seven, and you grab two of them, and then you have to place down one of them without showing your teammates what the other token is. And you have to place them according to the rules stated on the four cards that are displayed. So, give us some... You have the game right there, Matt. Give us some examples of these cards. There'll be a card like, if both your tiles are the same, play one here. That's obviously... Yeah, that's kind of the... That's that's, the ultimate winner. Yeah, so if one of your fates... uh, The tiles are called fates. If one of your fates is exactly two more or two less than the other, play one of them here. So by doing that, you're giving some information to your partners or partner, and then they are trying to get predict or guess which tile you kept hidden. Yeah, there are a couple that are things like, if one of your fates is one, two, or three, and the other is not, play the one, two, or three here. Yeah. Um, So they're just kind of various things, like, or if the sum is a, is, if the sum is even, or the sum is above 11, that sort of thing. And then on its face, it seems like, okay, oh, it's just a very simple deduction thing. You figure out what his car, what his other token can or can't be, and then you kind of make a guess if you want. But what happens is you look at, okay, you first deduce what it can't be or what it can be, but then you look at the other card options and say, oh, if it was, in fact, this other possibility, then he could have gone to this other space and eliminated more of the numbers. So I'm guessing it's maybe not that space. But also, is he smart enough to think of that possibility and reject it? The um, eternal question in these sorts of games. Yeah, so you're also... That's what I mean by implications, is that you're also looking at the other choices they could have made and trying to gain information by the fact that they didn't choose those. And you're kind of going around, you don't have to guess every turn, but you're trying to go around and figure out what number the person is holding back. And so if you don't guess the first round, then they draw, when it comes around to their turn again, they draw one tile and they play one of those two. So then you have to sit there and wonder, well, did they play the new one they drew and they have the same, so all the information I had before is still applicable to his tile because it's the same one, or did he play out the tile he was holding before and now I have to start over with all the deduction? And... In all of this, there's kind of a cool thing going where the more tiles you place in front, these cards expire, and that's how you gain doom and stuff like that. So yeah, it's 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 a fun balance of trying to quickly guess what other people have against the risk of being wrong. Yeah, so really clever. I was able to get a review copy of it, so we're going to be reviewing it fairly soon. And the the comment I had is that I find it pretty fun now. But 
my immediate thought after playing the game was that if I had this game like in middle school, I would have loved it. Yeah, so like high school math teachers get this game. Logic school, teachers, yeah. Like advanced math teachers get this game. Put it in the back of your classroom. Because ultimately, like, we're able to, in most cases, I'd say, like, 90% of the cases figure out the ultimate, like, like the correct play, and then we're able to figure out the correct odds for guessing. Like, we kind of, in, in any given situation, almost all the time, there's not a whole lot of ambiguity. But, but there's enough uncertainty that it's fun to play but the process of of doing the thought process to get to that point is yes. still entertaining yes absolutely. even though if the ultimate conclusion is that everyone knows okay if i guess it's a 50 50 and it's inexpensive and looks great yeah it looks amazing i i'm excited oh, and we about also it. got the expansion which, which adds more zany cards more zany cards which yeah. i think will be important for our replayability correct because it'll do things like allow you to delay the game or Various other things. I don't. There's some interesting abilities there that we haven't played with yet, but look intriguing. Hey guys, I must. I must run. I'm actually going to go play a game of Code Names, so I feel like it's appropriate. That this is an acceptable excuse. I won't cut you out of the podcast. All right. All right. Even if it's Code Names. <laughs> What's that? Even if it's Code Names. I love Code, code names. names. Yeah, we all love right. Code Names. Okay. Code Names was a great game. Have fun. Thanks, guys. Bye, bye Lindsay. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. Let me interrupt this board game talk to say that Wes had figured out the conjugation. It is lambit ergo est. I lick, therefore it is. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I need to learn this. Lambit? What is it? Lambit. Well, in, in Latin, all the I's are E. Lambit. So just think. L-A-M-B-I-T. Just think lamb beat. Yeah. Like you're beating ergo. a shit. No, 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 bit. It's S. like bit. It bit it, but it's not. Yeah. Lamb bit. Oh. Lamb bit. No, there you go. E. Lamb beat. Lamb beat? Right. Amber, yeah, Latin's, you, Latin's the same as Spanish, right? Do you right? comprehend mm -hmm. my or Latin? Or rather, Spanish is the same as Latin. <laughs> We're talking about. Amber, Wild Amber has appeared. We're talking about our lick based epistemology. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wes. Next, we have a game that Mark insists is great and a classic, even though none of us really had fun playing it. It's big. I am convinced that you guys had fun playing it. That game is El Grande, one of the classics of the 90s. We've got Catan and basically El Grande, and that's about it that remains in terms of popularity. Maybe Bonanza. I think that was the 90s. Classic area control game. With lots of cubes. We all love cubes. It's got a little tower thing, the Castillo. Best part of the game. Well, second best part of the game. I think the bidding for turn order and stuff is, is really good. Yeah, that's the best part. That's the best part the of the game. The fact that there is a large three-dimensional castle that you put cubes in is the second best part. Everyone likes to put cubes in a castle. I agree that the bidding is really cool. I feel like at a high level, that bidding would be so interesting. I disagree. I think at a high level, that bidding system is flawed why I'm why curious. yeah because because i think at a high level you could count when you're going first in turn order and take way too much advantage of that but i think that's that's built into the game like that's intended to be something to be exploited i guess yeah i probably overstated it bubba i i think it would be interesting so when we played this was the first time most of us had played we were all just kind of shooting from the hip as far as the bidding went. I think it'd be more interesting kind of knowing how the game goes. I just, I, the bidding part was the er, the or the facet of this game that made me think, oh, that's something that would have been innovative and is why this game is remembered. I think that's one part of it. I think it's also the, the action cards are, are interesting and cause enough variation to make genuinely difficult decisions. And I think... It's improved upon with the way Dominant Species do it, and Dominant Species is clearly influenced by this game, but Dominant Species takes the whole bidding to see what action cards you get and makes that just a small part of the entire, in a sense, bidding worker placement process. And I mean, adds a little bit more complexity to I, it. I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Dominant Species is definitely a hybrid game that has like war game facets and other things kind of mixed in there. 
but I, I can see kind of the... I mean, I think Dominant Species takes El Grande and just builds off of it. Yeah. Like, I, I think El Grande is clearly the starting point for that game. Th- that I think you're right. I got the same feeling in El Grande that I get in Dominant Species. Uh, and, and I've talked about this before, where every time I play Dominant Species, there are moments where I'm like, I never want to play this game again. I hate this game. And by the end, I, I always end up really enjoying it. And, y- and you can swing some really fun plays that uh, it's a good game. I had that same kind of twofold experience where some moments I was like, I hate this game. El Grande so much. And some moments felt good with the action cards. You you make a good play and it, it is cool. I just hated it more than I loved it. Sure. I, I can see that. But, I, but I also, think... it's, it's not... It, it, the conflict is in, in El Grande is just something that doesn't make me feel great. Sure. It's, it's not a pure Euro in that you're directly combating other people for territory. And it's a Euro and look... Certainly, it's very beige, but I, I I do like area control, and I think it does it in such an elegant, simple way. It, I enjoy it a lot. I will say that the first time I played it, I played it with three players, and that felt a lot better, specifically because there were fewer cards played. So you're only taking three of the five cards. And this one, it was a it was like okay, all of them are going to be played or specifically blocked from being played. So I got to figure out just on the margin what's the best play for me to try to get. Or how can I bid and still have acceptable losses based on what other people are going to do. In the three-player game, it was a lot more of trying to outguess and like make plays specifically that were going to hurt this other player because they needed that card a lot. It felt like the bidding, there was a lot more of trying to outguess your opponent rather than I'll put this card in because I think I'll get maybe second or third in this round, and that's going to give me a card that will be positive. I thought the action cards were just so random, it was impossible to have any strategy beyond what am I doing this round, and that really took away a lot of enjoyment for me. I mean, in that sense, it felt closer to Rising Sun than Dominant Species for me. See, but I enjoy that. I think each round is its own little game, and, and each but round I you're enjoy trying to other squeeze games like that. But this just, it just wasn't fun. I don't. It just, it felt so random, and it was hard to tell if something was even a net benefit for me. I mean, I could count like, well, I'm going to get five points from this, but other pe- some people are going to get more, some people are going to get less, and then I don't really know what this other card is going to do or who's going to play it. So, I don't know. It was just. It was hard to have any sort of cohesive strategy. My options were so limited in the last couple of turns. It's like, well, I can put all my cubes here and I might get one point because someone else has already spent nine cubes here and there's no way I can ever break that. See, I, so, I don't understand I, how you I, can I... say that's random. Like everyone sees all the information. Like each round, once you flip over the cards, nothing in there is random. But it's it's which cards come up on the turn when you are able to do something about it. Yeah, but I don't think like I don't think the cards vary that much. Each of the five or each of the four stacks of cards have a similar action in each round. Like they all do a similar thing. One scores something, one lets you move around cubes. Yeah, certainly after playing it and understanding what all the cards do, I have that view. You know, that you, you, you can kind of, you vaguely know what each stack is going to do. Playing it the first time, there there were cards that came up that completely blew me away. Huh. See, I find the game to be much more on the margin in that there's not, there's not a ton of swinginess compared to other area control games I've played. See, that was my problem with it. Like, I found that I don't think people were rewarded well enough for creative or even good plays i felt like some turns i would make a really good play and feel really good about it and then just not realize any benefit from it or very very little like the benefits were very marginal i understand what you mean there i get the feeling that might be a product of the fire player game which is a lot more crowded when i think back to my first play at three players 
like the score was not even as close as it was with five players. And I felt like there were a lot more kind of dramatic moments, especially with the bidding. And in that game, Kyle ended up winning, I think, by like 30 points or something, which didn't seem like that was something that could be possible in the five player game because there's so much like attrition on the board in terms of fighting over every little point. Hmm. I could be misremembering the first play I had, or it could be a game where, you know, it changes substantially with player count. I think it would also be better the second time you played it. Moving on to London, the game I played back a few weeks ago, one of the smaller conferences for the first time, and got to play it again uh, with Matt and our friend Steve. And I enjoyed it just as much this time. I'm curious what you think of it, Matt, because you seem to both enjoy and hate it at the time. Did I? Did I? It was a good time of just celebrating poverty. <laughs> I, I think I liked it. Yeah. So it's a light game that has interesting decisions every turn. Those games that present you with like X number of cards... And then you basically decide, like, am I going to pick up one of the cards visible to me or am I going to play the cards? It just makes for interesting decisions that aren't too hard or too consequential, but they're always interesting. Yeah, it's again, it's an engine builder where you're trying to gain efficiency and build off of your own positive feedback loops. But it has this very severe negative feedback loop where as you create a a tableau in front of you that is able to get more done more efficiently you also build up more poverty which can really hurt you Uh, so one thing though it's more tactical than something like an engine builder so you basically you build up a city which basically means you play some cards in front of you and then at some point you run your city and at that point you do do whatever the effects are on all the buildings in your city and then you flip them over and you gain poverty. At that point, I found myself kind of going for a, a new strategy as I rebuilt my city. Because you're going to put cards on top of pretty much all those cards you just flipped over. Oh, yeah. It, it's certainly so, tactical. And, and I mean, it becomes more strategic when you kind of know what cards are out there. Like I knew that they're going to be... I knew a bit about how the poverty reduction cards were going to scale up as we got through the deck yeah. the second time. Yeah, but so if you run your city four or five times in the game, like w- whatever you made your city the first time really has no impact on the last city you make. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I think it's more tactical than that, but it's it's interesting. It's interesting decisions. There's a cool thing with like the common board, and there can only be so many discarded cards before it gets cleared. So there's some controlling of that. There's a lot of control over how fast or slow the game goes. Yes, that was, was cool. That was cool. Yeah. You said it takes 45 minutes. It took us an hour and a half. It's probably somewhere in between that. But it's it's still an, an hour, hour-ish. An hour-ish, probably. Yeah. Well, I think it could be real quick once you know the cards well. It's got a lovely theme, like I said, of celebrating poverty. And, and, the, and, and the great England. poverty reduction effects of... Sewers. Uh, sewers and prisons. Prison. And prisons, <laughs> prisons yes. And I, sewers. I, went, I went heavy prisons, Orion. It didn't work. Oh. <laughs> it almost worked. My first game, I went heavy loans, and I shot out to a huge lead, and then I took the penalty for the loans and lost. Yeah, <laughs> I ended up with two loans. I think I had like four I won, my first game. <laughs> I won by going big money in the middle game, and then just building a bunch of sewers, which flush poverty right out to sea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nice. Oh, poverty. Oh, also, our, our buddy Steve stopped by and played that with us, which was a blast. Yeah. Hi, that's Steve, a, if you're listening. That's another cool thing about a conference with 100,000 people is you probably know one or two of them. If you can find them. <laughs> if you text them and tell them your precise location, yes. <laughs> Moving from poverty to Nordic fishing, we played the new Uwe Rosenberg game, Nusfjord, which is a delight to say and pronounce, Nusfjord. But it's about Nordic fishing. It's a game about building buildings and hiring elders and fishing lots of fish. It's about catching fish and cutting down trees. Yes, cutting down forests, deforestation, or replanting forests. Or thinning the trees. 
or yeah, thinning the trees. Fish There's and wood lots of forest related activities. Fish and wood are the two main resources, and then sometimes you will get money. <laughs> yes, sometimes <laughs> money's really tight compared to fish and wood. We end up with piles of fish and wood, and then like two coins. Yeah, which was rough at times. It was a fun game. It felt like an Uve game. There were round, you know, disc action pawns to take your actions. Uh, you blocked other people, although not as harshly as Agricola. Yeah, I got blocked maybe twice in the game, and it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it's just not as harsh. Like, Agricola, like, if you don't know what you're doing, you can just get screwed and... Go into negative points, Negative yeah. points. And this, yeah, no, you would you would never, like, just completely die. You could be behind, but you can almost always do something productive. So you're always moving forward, and I don't know, it was fun. You, like, get these piles of resources, and then you figure out what to spend them on and like i think most uve games you really feel like it's your actions that are limiting you the number of actions you have to get things done yeah i I really enjoyed all the different varieties of buildings i think that was my favorite part that you looked at this giant display of i don't know 15 to 20 buildings and you you know, considered the possibilities of what kind of interesting maneuvers they will let you do. And I enjoyed planning my strategy around the buildings. You could also go for a lot of elders. The elders thing was interesting because there's a little bit of a shared pool where you had this communal table where you had to put fish on them. And you essentially sold your fish to this table to get money, which are your victory points. So that could be powerful, but you need lots and lots of fish to do it. But whenever someone takes an elder, they take one of the fish off the table. And if it's empty, you just can't get elders. And elders can be pretty powerful. It's a lot cheaper in fish to feed the, the first two plates. And then after that, it's like three or four fish per plate. Yeah, so you're kind of incentivized to keep the communal plate just full enough where you can get an elder if you want it, but hopefully maybe block other people from getting an elder. So a pleasant Uve game. I think I like it better than Caverna even. I would have to play Caverna again. Although the thing with Caverna, there was just so many buildings. It, like I didn't even know what was possible. So I just went for the run- ones in front of me, I think. Yeah, physically in front <laughs> physically of you front that of you could read more easily. There's like 80 buildings you can build or something. Yeah. I almost suggested we try a feast for Odin, but I th- I think that might have exploded your guys both your heads. Yeah, as someone who just experiences analysis paralysis in these kind of games, it's it's just tough playing them the first time where I have no idea the implications of any of the fifteen buildings that are in front of me or the six elders. But I mean, I guess that's just that's kind of this genre of game is you have lots of different options to buy and you're like Like, you said you're limited in the actual actions that you can do the number of actions right i don't know if i would like it more if i played it enough to 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 know the buildings and and stuff like that but oh i think it would be great i think because i think think it'd be better i could discover strategies through those buildings because that's definitely there's also three entire sets of buildings oh yeah there there are three there's a b and c buildings that you'll play with but there's you choose one of three decks and each of those decks has a completely unique set of a b and c buildings oh yeah that's like variability up the wazoo that's excessive almost and i think we only went through about half of each deck yeah or half of each category within the deck we chose yeah but that excites me because then you can kind of look at the starting buildings and then maybe create a whole new strategic line of play you hadn't seen before just because that particular combination of buildings hadn't come up before. I don't know how unique it would be. I don't think it would be as unique as Dominion. Oh, no, uh, not that. But, but compared be, to other kind of medium-weight like Euros... Which efficiency you, you find and which uh, bonuses you combine for that game. So yeah. it, it would make replaying it fun and a new puzzle each time. Yeah, yeah. I really liked it. I have a comment... I took a bunch of pictures I'm looking at right now. Us playing this game, everyone looks like they're having an awful day. But let me, okay, I'm going to go around and look at this picture. Compare, well, I want to compare it to the pictures of us playing El Grande, in which Mark looks like it's Christmas morning. <laughs> it's like Mark just like so pleased with himself pointing at something. All right, I've examined these pictures, and in the El Grande one, I look pleased, yes. I do enjoy that game. 
In the Newsfjord one, I look deep in thought, and that is the greatest look. I don't look like I'm not having a bad time. I look like I'm thinking. That's what you want in a, in a Euro game. Dower, looking down at the table, I don't know. Orion. contemplating calculations. Moving on to Mark's favorite game and my most tilting game, we have Pulsar 2849. Wait, most tilting? Did you not like it? No, it was great, but I had to leave halfway through it. Oh, true. Oh, that's right. Yeah, sadly. It looked so much fun, and then I had... Well, for one, we started... We spent forever setting up because you got trolled by someone who's buying your tickets, and we were kind of just waiting for you and getting lunch or dinner or whatever... And then I had to leave to go get on some conference call or work or something, whatever. And yeah, so... And then you guys played again when I wasn't there on Saturday, I think. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, we liked it so much that we played it a second time. Yeah, Pulsar... Well, call back to... Was it Unplugged or last year at PAX East where we played Alien Frontiers? Oh, yeah, I think that Our was very the, first podcast we talked about. Last it. year at PAX East, at PAX East, we played East, Alien Frontiers. Which I'd always heard it was a good game. I heard it was a nice dice placement game, which I tend to like those. And we did not like it at all. Pulsar... a little bit wrong, but... A little bit, but I don't, think it would have fi- I don't think it would have fixed the problems we had with it. Pulsar 2849 is the game that Alien Frontiers wishes it was. Absolutely. I, that's simply what it is. It is also a dice placement game dice worker you know action selection game you know like castles of burgundy or something like that but oh it's it's so fun like everything you do in that game is fun you have to know what the median of a set of numbers is to to play the game yeah there there there's some really innovative things i think the circular board all the the circular board it looks so cool actions i think the coolest thing is that the beginning of the round you roll a bunch of dice and then you lay them out in order and then you you take turns in a snake draft selecting them but when you select a, a, a die how far it is from the median ends up affecting these two tracks that that can basically impact your initiative or your resource resources gained it's just so cool that the selection of the die has an impact on other parts of the game. And a fairly significant one. Like, yeah. Those are pretty important. But you you generally want higher numbers because they do more powerful things, generally speaking. But that tends to move your pieces down on these initiative tracks, uh, whereas mm-hmm. ones tend to move them up. Yeah, and, and there are just so many cool things to do. You have this entire technology board that unlocks more and more spots throughout the game that'll give you passive benefits or one-time use benefits or end game scoring benefits and you're fighting over those because only two of them can be taken by two different players you can fly your ship around and land on planets and get bonuses from that one of the biggest ways to get points is to take pulsars take control of pulsars if you like them you go onto them and drop a ring on them literally a ring of your color and then you get these gyrodynes, they're called, and you spin them on the pulsar, and that's kind of the sci-fi tech that you're playing this game around. But that just gives you lots of points as income each round. But at the end of the game, you also get a lot of points if you if you land on a bunch of different planets across the board. You have your own player board, which is randomly determined, and there are four different ones, and they're both double. They're all double sided, so you can choose which side you want, and that gives you a selection of actions you can do. And then there's this whole tableau building thing that will give you immediate points or immediate bonuses and passive income. And if you connect them together and invest in them, you can get extra dice to use on your turn. There's just so much you can do, but they're very easily understood and clear strategic paths that are all valuable and you can't do all of them but you can do a couple of them yeah in, and it, 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 at least in a first impression went. you just feel good because you know you're accomplishing something from the you know four rounds that i played every choice mattered and there was always a lot of things you could do and so you were deciding between you know a bunch of good options trying to find an efficient path while balancing these other considerations of choosing dice and so on yeah, and I think a dice selection mechanism in a game where there are very clear strategic paths with kind of, again, positive feedback loops where as you land on more planets, the, the points you gain per planet increase, things like that. 
is an interesting combination because the dice are naturally going to open up a wider variety of options, but you're trying to focus, I guess, to be, to maximize points, you want to focus more. And so you have to weigh the pros and cons of just kind of going with the dice and trying to stay high on initiative or trying to manipulate the dice into doing the things like the clear strategic paths you want to do. And that tension I find is really, was really fun. Plus it it looks so cool. It looks cool. Like all the randomness is really pleasant randomness. <laughs> that that's not like a real. We're gonna talk about this in the future, but there are games with good randomness and bad randomness, and this was good randomness. Yeah, I don't know if it's that clear, but there. But this is an example of pre-decision randomness, which is generally considered more strategic, right? So the dice are rolled first, and then you make decisions based on that information. Yeah, all the cool tech is randomized. Yeah, I, I love this game. I'm whenever I get through playing games that we haven't played yet and I'm looking for a new game or I want to do a cool stuff order, I think this is gonna be top of the list to kind of throw in that, that order. I really truly love it. C G E. C G E. Great publisher. Yeah. It's got the same art connections as Ga- to uh, Yeah, some of the same art assets. Yeah, to uh Galaxy Trucker and Space Alert. <laughs> Yeah, that's never a bad thing. Not at all. And that, I think, was the highlight of the con for me. That it was just such a fun game and kind of a surprise because we kind of, I had heard that it was good. You saw the cover, I think, yeah. and said, wow, that Early looks kind of week, cool. I just walked through the free play game selection and this was one of the three games that stood out. And I didn't know anything about it. I, like, I really didn't know what kind of game it was. So I'm like, sure, let's play that. And. It ended up being great, so great surprise, and a game that will feature probably fairly highly on my best of 2017 list, finalized when I ever get around to that, or rather when I ever get around to play the remaining 2017 games I have here, and then compile the list. I think that wraps it up for this podcast, our PaxCast. Is that what I called it at the beginning? I don't remember. No, you called it episode 28 or 29 or something like that no i said something else after that it's a pax cast that's a that's a fun word i just invented thanks for listening if you enjoy the podcast check out the thoughtfulgamer.com where i post all kinds of reviews and articles don't forget to rate and review it on itunes check me out on facebook or twitter and like we said before if you want to watch us record the podcast live and be part of our awesome discord chat community where we discuss games and make rants and all kinds of good stuff like that check out the patreon what i we got to play pulsar with mark from the patreon oh yeah one of our supporters we found at uh cool to meet up with him yeah pax east and we got played one of the games of pulsar with him and i think he really liked it as well he beat us that's true he he did quite well anyways if you want to be part of that community Go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. And I would appreciate any and all support that you can give to help us keep doing what we're doing. We'll talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.